Welcome to the Black Creator Series, brought to you by Candlewick Press in collaboration with Red Clay Educators, hosted by Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, bringing dynamic books, authors, illustrators, and artists to your classroom and to the world. Look for episodes of the Black Creator Series on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Here's Candlewick's Kathleen Rourke to introduce this week's guest. Thanks for joining us. Our guest creator this episode is Aya DeLeon, who many of you may know as the seasoned author of contemporary crime fiction for adults. Undercover Latina is her debut book for young readers. The suspense-filled novel received a starred review from Kirkus, and the review lauded the book as a fun read centered on kids of color. The narrative is accessible and engaging, never shying away from difficult conversations about race and privilege or the many forms white supremacy can take. An engaging, insightful adventure with a heartfelt conclusion. I now turn the conversation over to Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, a New York Times bestselling author, educator, founder of Red Clay Educators, and co-founder of the Institute for Racial Equity in Literacy. Aya, thank you for joining the Black Creator Series. Oh, it's a delight to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Super excited. So not only are you an acclaimed writer, you're also a teacher of writing. Yes, I am for uh, (laughs) pushing like 17 or 18 years. I have been teaching creative writing at UC Berkeley in the African-American studies department. And, um, you know, I feel so blessed to be teaching creative writing because essentially among, you know, college students, I just think of them as young adults, you know, Um, and I'm doing in that context, I'm doing young adult development and helping them get language for writing about their lives, lots and lots of young people of color. And it's just, you know, I feel I know when I was in college. You know, there were these classes that I was taking, but the thing I was most obsessed with was my own life and my friends and what we were doing. And so it's really a joy to um, be part of that process of helping young adults come to voice to develop language for their experiences and, you know, what they believe and feel and think all of that. So that's really fun. So I'm wondering if you see part of your role as a teacher of writing at the post-secondary level is to help writers explore their authentic voice and the ways this is connected to their identities? Absolutely. So um, I uh, have been director of June Jordan's Poetry for the People program. And June Jordan was a really fierce Black woman author, also Caribbean and Afro-Latina. Although those weren't kind of the identity terms of the time, but those are her heritages in Latin America and the Caribbean. And Um, she really created this huge space in poetry as a very acclaimed author to encourage college students and other community members that she worked with to um, really trust that our voices, our stories, our language was just as valuable as sort of standard English um, and the canon you know, and she did a lot of work around African-American vernacular English and really created a space um, not just for Black folks, but would encourage uh, folks who come from immigrant lineages to include what uh, she called home language in their poetry. Obviously, you know, if you're from Vietnam and you're writing in the United States, you can't write the whole poem in Vietnamese because your U.S. audience won't understand it. But a couple of key phrases will really... Um, bring it home both to the author and the audience, and especially anyone in the audience who does speak the language. You know, so she really fought for that. She really fought for the idea that um, the literature, both, um, you know, historically and currently written by people of color, is equally valuable. She really fought against that heavy racism and classism um, and uh, xenophobia that has been such a fixture of um, education. And what she found and what I find as well is that we've got to write against that. We've got to push against that in the teaching, right? Because by the time students get to college, like they have these robotic analytical voices that they have developed because, you know, the racist experiences that they've had in K-12 education has really taught them like, Spanish is what you speak at home. Standard English is what you speak at school. That um, all the flavor, 
you know, all the visuals, all the creativity, you know, in some ways really has been um, sort of sucked out of their everyday um, voices and they've got to fight for it. They've got to fight to get it back. Yeah. And I think it can be challenging for educators to recognize that writing isn't neutral, right? That writing is political, it's historical, it's ideological, it is informed and shaped by our identities. And I see this acknowledgement of that as an invitation um, extended more to K-12 writers of like, personal narratives or memoir, but not as much when students are invited to write fiction, at least in K through 12. Storytelling techniques and craft moves and structures taught can can silence the kind of imaginative, diverse approaches that you were just chatting about. What are ways educators can invite their students to bring their full selves to the page as writers of fiction? One thing that's always just great, and I I see right now, sort of in the past decade or so, this real outpouring, um, especially in the middle grade, is about the myths of people's traditions, Mm. right? We have these incredible sort of imprints and series where you have authors of color writing about, um, writing these sort of fantasy stories that hinge on the the myths of different um, people of color coming out of the global South, right? And for many, many years, there's the obsession, you know, with kind of Greek mythology and, you know, certain um, canon fascination, right? With um, traditions coming out of, you know, Europe. Um, But it's fabulous to see all of these myths coming out of Asia, the Caribbean, Latin America, out of Africa, out of, you know, what some people talk about, Arab culture, Southwest Asia, North Africa, you know, these different um, mythologies and that they're informing the literature for young people. So I think I think that that's one great place to start. Like, what are the stories of your people, you know? And then, um, and I think young people, because of this new canon of work out there is really helping young people imagine like, How do we create a world that speaks to our traditions, but then also has contemporary characters engaging? So I think that that's one resource that's out there and really, really strong right now. That is a great um, suggestion for educators to push not only against these kind of identity silencing um, practices that can exist in curriculum, um, but to push forward with uh, the kind of writing instruction that is identity inspiring and identity affirming. You are known for writing page turners for adult readers, and you have not disappointed <laughs> with Undercover Latina. I mean... Wow, readers will not be able to put this down. The first chapter made me feel like I was watching a fast-paced spy movie with all of the tension and quick thinking and moving parts that keep viewers on the edge of their seat. What inspired you to write this incredible novel? And as someone who's written quite a bit for adult readers, What's it like to shift to writing for young people? Oh, what a great question. You know, so the first thing that I have to say about um, Undercover Latina is that it was really fun to write. And for me, the, the beginning really was about sort of the spy story, this, you know, this organization called The Factory, which you know, is this imaginary organization that's like an international spy organization that fights racism and protects people of color around the globe. Like, I loved the idea, you know, because it's part of, the best part of writing fiction is being able to imagine things that actually aren't happening, but that like would or could or would make the world better, right? So I was like, yes, the factory, you know, doing their thing. So it was really fun to think about that. 
Um, and that was inspiring. And then the other thing for me, so I'm um, Afro-Latina. My background is African-American from the South out of South Carolina, Puerto Rican from the Caribbean, and also West Indian from St. Kitts and Nevis. And so those are the three heritages that come together to sort of form my cultural perspective. And my mom, who is Puerto Rican, is very, very light-skinned, often mistaken for white. And she would tell me stories about what that experience was like for her. And she said, yeah, the worst part about looking white is that I get to hear what white people think about us when they think we're not listening, you know? And so there was this sense of my mom as a spy, you know, racially um, imagining her sort of as this spy character. And so when I went to write this book, she was in my head, you know? And so this character and my mom, you know, she's a civil rights attorney. She's always done a lot of different kinds of political organizing. So, you know, she looks white and she's clearly always been on the side of black people, Latinx people and people of color. So really Andrea is modeled on her, you know, modeled on, um, the idea that you can pass or be mistaken for white and that that doesn't actually determine your agenda, that you uh, can still have a really strong anti-racist agenda. So that was one of the things going on with the book. And then another thing uh, for me was about, um, you know, wanting that action, that page turning action. Um, and so for with that piece, I really took a page right out of the spy canon, you know, James Bond. A lot of times the Bond stories begin with the end of the previous mission, right? So at the climax of the previous mission, we see him like hanging from a helicopter, fighting with some guy and then getting away, you know, with some random woman, right? Who will prove to be irrelevant to the story because that's how James Bond did it, right? So I loved the idea of starting with the end of this, of the previous um, mission. Whereas I noticed that for the most part, um, with this middle grade, younger YA space, I'm writing about young people who come from pretty intact families, especially the factory series, like the whole family is spying for the movement, you know, and like, you know, all is relatively well. And there's not a big trauma history that these young people have to work through that really the character arc is about agency. They're coming from being, you know, kind of younger children who don't have agency. And then these missions sort of put them in a position where they have to step up to these big um, adult responsibilities in terms of like spying and rescuing people and saving, you know, the world, the family, the whoever. Um, and that's the arc. That's the arc. And, and I find that really satisfying. I find it really satisfying with adults to write about kind of having to go back and clean up trauma. And I find it really satisfying with young people having sort of the danger and the politics lurk outside of the family, outside of the community, right? That it's sort of about racism or some other thing coming at them and they're a team fighting against it. So I'd say, I think those are the biggest differences in terms of writing for young people and adults. Well, this is incredible because I'm obsessed with your main character, Andrea. She takes on an assignment because of her skills and her talents and because she's able to pass for white. So while readers are enraptured by this story, um, you find these authentic moments to give them insight into what it's like for Andrea and her family to navigate issues such as colorism, racism, microaggressions, and white supremacy. What made you want to invite young readers into the nuanced conversation that is all of those things, particularly colorism. And in what ways are you hoping this book and the experiences of Andrea and her mother will activate readers' critical consciousness about race and identity? Oh, I love that question. I think, um, I think that part of what I want to show, especially young readers, is that how you look doesn't need to determine where you 
kind of where you decide you stand, right? And I I think um, there's a way that within communities of color, um, you know, there are all kinds of really hard ways that people act out internalized racism around color. So one way that we know that it goes down that is just brutal is um, mistreatment of darker skinned people, mistreatment of folks who look more indigenous, more African, whether it's hair or skin or features or body, like, you know, there's just a certain viciousness. And if you look at the statistics, particularly in the black community, the statistics show that darker skinned people, you know, make less money, have worse health outcomes. You know, like if you look if in, in where the studies have been done, um, we can document that those inequities are real. It's not just like so-and-so did or didn't think that this other person was cute, right? Like there are real, um, real disparities that connect with colorism. And um, another way that colorism can show up, which is a really different kind of experience has to do with shunning, questioning someone's legitimacy. And we see that happen with people who are light-skinned. We also see that happen with folks who, however they may look, may have grown up around white people, maybe transracially adopted by white people, maybe mixed heritage and raised by white people or more around white people. So, you know, you have these different ways that internalized racism shows up. And I think part of what I really wanted, which is why I have like a 20 page author's note. No, it's not 20 pages, it's a few pages. But I have this long author's note because part of what I also wanted to be clear about is that there's a way that sometimes people who are light-skinned, mixed heritage, transracially adopted may feel like, well, you know, this group of, people of color or over the years, various people of color have said, we don't want you. You're not good enough. You can never really be part of us. You don't belong. And folks have decided to believe that, right? Like, well, I guess they know, I guess I, you know, I guess I don't really get to be part of this community. And, you know, one of the things that I'm saying here is like, actually, no, like I'm saying no, that the fight against racism requires all of us to stand up and stand together against racism. And I don't care, you know, what someone has said to you about how like you don't belong. Actually, we all belong in the fight against racism, even white people. So come on down and let's do this. And I, and and also, you know, sometimes people have participated. You know, sometimes people have been told you don't belong, but sometimes people have participated. They laughed at the jokes. They wanted, you know, the white people's approval or the light-skinned people's approval. They were glad that they were included. They were glad that they weren't targeted. They participated in targeting somebody, whatever that is. Then people think, well, now, you know, well, I've picked a side. Nope, you can pick again. So I think that's part of it for me, um, you know, that... Um, that West African concept of Sankofa, that you can go back and retrieve it, right? So that for me was really important as part of this story that um, it that who what you look like and even your behavior in the past mm -hmm. does not need to determine where you decide to land around racism. And that's why I think the scene with her mom which was written very, very late in the process, I realized like, oh, there's something I haven't said yet about this and I need to say it. And we see her mom as someone who had participated, you know, as a young person, not really knowing better, um, being socialized into a particular position. We see the mom participating in anti-Black racism and later understanding what she had done, feeling bad about it and making a different choice. I, I'm telling you, this book is critical right now for young people because they are literally navigating everything that you are describing. They are watching white supremacist groups, not only storming the U.S. Capitol, but parading and caravanning through their communities, right? And some of them are trying to figure out where do I stand, right? And they're seeing these groups show up at board meetings to censor and ban books. 
These events and issues are impacting their daily lives. Um, so Undercover Latina is an opportunity for young people to not only become enveloped in this fantastic story, but also to develop racial literacy, to develop language that can help them have wider conversations about their lived realities. Your writing is imbued with significance. And I want to talk about the name of the organization, the international organization that Andrea and her family um, work for. It is known as the Factory. And um, here you say the International Alternative Intelligence Consortium or the Factory is an association with several intelligence organizations of people of color. We aren't affiliated with any government, although we have a worldwide network of friends in the FBI and CIA and other government agencies. The factory uses different nonviolent strategies. Its members are trained in weapons, tradecraft, and self-defense. We gather information and leak it to the press. We help whistleblowers. There are several democratically elected Latin American leaders alive today because of us. And you can see we're early in the novel, so I don't want to have any spoiler uh, spoilers, but um, I do want to ask, um, when we think about the word factory, we think about a place where things are manufactured. Um, and so because your writing is imbued with significance and because we know authors name people in places with great intention, what do you want young readers to consider regarding your naming of this organization, The Factory, as they go on this journey with you? That is such a great question. You know, nobody has ever asked that before. I think, um, you know, for me, there was something about the factory. What I liked about it was that it was just super working class. You know, I think that the spying is so often associated with like the owning class and like wealthy people and, you know, the spy in like the fabulous eight bazillion dollar suit and like super glamorous designer dress, you know, and they, you know, look like they're straight off a red carpet and they're going to like this super duper wealthy dinner, you know, and I think I wanted, you know, in all of my work, I, I'm writing about race and gender, but also very much about class, you know, and the, the reason that the factory doesn't exist is that like, you know, there's not a group of people that I'm aware of that has enough money right to, to run that kind of organization. But, you know, we're running different nonprofit versions of the factory doing that work, right, but not at the international espionage level. And I think that that really was it for me, that I liked the idea that factories are historically places of great labor organizing, you know, and that that for me, what's critical in these times is political movements. And so there was something about calling it a factory that was like funny um, and in some ways absurd, right? Like spies don't work in a factory, but that it was sort of a harking back to a time when, you know, you had a lot of working class people working in factories. There still are factories um, all over the world, um, you know, but less of that kind of manufacturing happening in the United States. So I think it was, you know, I, I think that it was, there was something that just rang true for me. It was a split second decision. It wasn't like I sat and thought, hmm, you know, it was a split second decision. And I think it was about that sort of um, claiming and celebrating the class heritage of, you know, working class people doing a lot of organizing and agitation over the years. And, you know, the labor movement has lots of challenges and complexity around different issues, race and gender, but I still do believe really in labor organizing as an academic, I'm part of a labor union and, um, you know, I'm active in my union. Um, so yeah, for me, that was one of the things that I wanted to play with there. And I just want to shout out Robin Benway, whose um, AKA series from like, 
no, maybe around 2009, 2010, um, was really the inspiration for that part of the book because she has this girl whose family is sort of freelancing as part of this um, spy organization that's not government affiliated. And I loved that. I loved the idea that you could just be this kind of homeschooling family who were spies kind of going about your business and um, and and that it really worked with middle grade, sort of younger um, YA to have this family environment context of spying um, that could be, you know, kind of nonviolent and uh, family friendly. Um, so shout out to Robin Benway. I loved that. And so they had their organization. I can't remember what it was called, but mine's the factory. I love that. I love that you said that you are writing about race. You are writing about gender. You are also writing about class. And so when teachers dig into this book with students, they can teach them about intersectionality and um, and how that influences groups of people and individuals. They can teach about symbolism as they think about the significance of the factory and its connection to uh, labor movements. And that, that the revolutionary, radical, focus and intentionality of these movements can be replicated like in a factory when we replicate, right? And so we think about these movements that have influenced other movements, right? So there's just so much with that. I I love it so much. What can young readers look forward to next? Will this be a series? Yes, it will. Um, So the second book in the series comes out in October of this year, and it's called Untraceable. So um, at some point in the novel, um, Andrea gets a colleague named Amani, and um, Untraceable is Amani's book. And in uh, Untraceable, we learn more about the roots of the factory and um, lots of exciting, juicy things going on there. In some ways, it's a prequel. Um, So it takes place before Undercover Latina. And in Undercover Latina, you hear Amani refer to her first mission, some challenges that happened there. And we see that in um, the the next book, the prequel, Untraceable. Um, And yeah, I, you know, I have some ideas beyond the second book, but they're not uh, fully baked yet. So um, I'm not sure. Uh, about a third book or what the time frame for that would be. But definitely um, we have uh, Untraceable. And in some ways, the, I, the idea for Untraceable, I had first. And when I was reading the, the Robin Benway series, um, I, and I was also reading Allie Carter's Gallagher Girls series, I just loved this thing around teen girls as spies. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, what could girls of color bring to the genre. And one of the things that I'm playing with a lot in Untraceable has to do with bodies, right? So one of the things that happens at the very beginning, this isn't a spoiler, at the very beginning of Untraceable, Amani, um, Amani, there's a fire at Amani's house. Um, She and her mom kind of go on the run. There's someone sort of after them. It's all a little unclear. And she has been going, they live in LA. She has been going to this majority white prep school in LA and she's a full figured girl. And so she has one, she's 15, I think. She has one sort of sense of her body and sense of having that body, how she sort of measures up in a context sort of romantically and as, you know, kind of a girl in one context. So that's the context she's been living in. So then she and her mom go on the run and they hide in plain sight at this urban high school. So one of the things that I'm playing with there is she goes from being sort of invisible, nobody is checking for her, to like being sexually harassed. Like she said, everybody's like, how you doing? And she's like, what? Me? You know, and I loved the idea of how spying intersects with kind of just being a teen girl. And we see that in Undercover Latina, right? It's the same trope. 
the homeschooled spy girl suddenly has to go to a real school. And, you know, I got that from Robin Benway. That's definitely happening in her AKA book. Um, But what are the twists to that around race? And we see in Undercover Latina, one of the twists to that around race is that Andrea has been getting some historically accurate information from her parents Um, And then goes to school in Arizona and is suddenly getting some information that, you know, many of us would question the historical accuracy, but it falls in line with kind of a more um, white dominant ideology, right? So she's like, what? And then we see some of the same things. We see, we see um, something different happening with Amani because she's going to a majority black school with black leadership, right? So she's not hearing you know, about the pilgrims or, you know, Christopher Columbus discovered America, but she's dealing with um, some different challenges in the black community that she's not encountered before. So that's one of the things that I just think is really, really fun about this spy series is that you get an opportunity to do this sort of fish out of water, um, these fish out of water tropes for these girls of color in these different environments where they're just like dealing with stuff for the first time. Your writing is propulsive, immersive, and centers characters that are too often invisible in children's literature. Your stories are opportunities for young readers to explore critical issues that can be silenced in classrooms, schools, and sometimes in households. As a result, Readers have a relationship with you and your work that is beyond transactional, it's transformational. What does it mean to you to be a Black creator? What a great question. I, you know, I was thinking about this because, you know, your series is the Black Creator Series. And, you know, I was thinking part of it for me is thinking about the lineage, right? Um as Black creators who have a platform or are being published, you know, we're coming out of a really, really hard history as African heritage people in the United States and in the Americas where there's been so much um, distortion, misinformation, um, defamation, right? Um, So uh, media has been weaponized against us in so many ways, print media, literature, and certainly, you know, motion pictures, um, all of it. And so there, it it feels, sometimes the responsibility feels really heavy. You know, sometimes the responsibility feels really heavy, like as a Black creator who has a platform within the industry, it's really important to me to use that platform to um, kind of show show Black people, show people of color in a light that is not, um, that is counter and pushing back on, you know, centuries of distortion, uh, racist distortion. At the same time, you know, there's also a history of a certain kind of rigidity in the ways that we write about our community, you know, a certain kind of like we must be constantly noble, you know, and, you know, there's also a history that I really appreciate the ways that the community has been pushing back on lately of like, we must tell the most miserable, you know, difficult stories, right? And, you know, there are plenty of miserable and difficult stories, old and new, to be told. And so I think when I think about, um, you know, the fight, particularly of a younger generation talking about Black joy, right? Like that fight for joy. And I I think for me, I'm trying to find that balance, right? I'm trying to find that balance. How can there be a story that's rooted in joy, that's rooted in a vision of winning, you know, that's rooted in our triumph over racism, um, but that also you know, I'm not interested in like having some little, um, you know, I'm not interested in creating some little rinky dink version of racism that we can just flick and knock over, right? Like that's not actually satisfying. What we're up against 
um, in terms of um, white rising white nationalism, what we're up against in terms of voter suppression, what we're up against in terms of white supremacy and systemic racism in the US and internationally is really significant. And I think for me, Undercover Latina was a way that I wanted to take that on where I wasn't underestimating the threat of white nationalism, but I had made it sort of right-sized and developmentally appropriate for kind of a middle grade crowd. You know, for me, being a Black creator is like trying to find creative ways that are fun and entertaining and pleasurable, but also deeply political um, that tell stories about us fighting and winning. Well, thank you, Aya. It's been a pleasure. Oh my goodness, such a delight. Thank you so much for having me and just uh, shout out to all the Black creators out there. Keep at it because our stories are very, very important. Thank you so much for amplifying us. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Black Creators Series, a Candlewick Press and Red Clay Educators collaboration. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notifications button so you won't miss an episode. For more information about the Black Creators Series, go to blackcreatorsseries.candlewick.com or soniacherrypaul.com or go to Red Clay Ed on Twitter and Instagram.